you guys. I literally just uploaded the video for chapter 6 and 7 a couple hours ago, and then I got this comment. Musical Lie wrote, um, if you actually read the book instead of judging it so much, you would know Xavier and Kelly love story is actually amazing. First off, Musical Lie, you must be new here. Hello, my name is Brakantisha Points, and I make fun of bad literature. Due to legal reasons, I can't call Torn Between Alphas a book. No way. Not legal reasons. This is literally not even a book. Second, I will admit that I have not yet read past anything posted in my most recent video. I don't know where the story is going to go. But at the same time, in the first seven chapters alone, there is literally no way to recover from an opening like that. I don't even care that Kelly and Xavier are literal soulmates, that Xavier is literally the bestest -est boyfriend in the history of bestest -est 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 boyfriends. Colton literally bought Kelly for him in an auction. The only reason why the two of them even met is because of this. And... I don't know, man. Maybe I'm just old and jaded and watch too much Law & Order, but if the opposite of that is being so delusional as to think that something like this story is ever actually okay, I think that I'll take my cynicism, thanks. And I don't know Musical Lie, but I really hope that she never has the unfortunate experience of having her drink drugged by some guy at a party, or having a guy force himself onto her, or to be kidnapped and sold into human trafficking rings, and just about a million other little things that could happen to women, especially a woman who is this naive. Like, I started off the encounter laughing at her initial comment, but by the end of our non-existent conversation i just legit feel bad for her because this is a girl who is going to let her innocence lead her into a dangerous situation and she'll end up getting hurt because of it yes torn between alphas is a fictional story but so is law and order that doesn't mean that the things being discussed here aren't real dangers that actual women have gone through. I think that my main takeaway from this should be that, yes, while this is fictional, stories like this are conditioning women that behavior like this is not only acceptable, but that it's desirable. That abusive men should get free passes if they're a combination of both rich but also good looking. That none of the abusive, terrible things that they do to women remotely matters because, again, they should get automatic passes simply because they are rich and good looking. As I said, I don't know what's going to happen in the rest of the story, but after the seventh chapter, literally nothing that happens is going to be remotely redeemable in the slightest. Stop making excuses for bad behaviors in men simply because they later turned out to be nice. A man not hitting you should not be the baseline of acceptable behavior. Anyway, before I could even start writing my actual review, the girl randomly pulled the I can do whatever I want card and also the authors can do whatever they want card, which I find funny because she can do whatever she wants and authors can do whatever they want, but apparently I'm not allowed to say and think whatever I feel like. This is hypocrisy at its finest, folks. It got really bad. A couple of other people jumped in. I deleted the entire thing because it was a fluster cluck. I'm also not going to sit here and try to reason with the brick wall, so bye. Anyway, enough of this cow poop. Chapter 8. Three days later, Anne Kelly randomly complains that nobody has touched her, which even Lola sees as a good thing. However, Kelly feels weird about the money. She She's also worried about him coming into her room while she's asleep. And then there's this weird thought of Lola's, that Xavier will probably wait until the daytime to take her blocked cave. She explains that she saw both of the boys leaving the house in the middle of the night, although I'm wondering why Lola was awake at that hour to begin with. Oh, but the good news is that Xavier is disease-free, because that's what I'm really worried about right now, getting gonorrhea. Kelly thinks for a second that neither of them have had any run-ins with either of the brothers, which I'm not really sure where any of this is going, especially since all we know that a big romance, or should I say romance, is coming for Kelly and Xavier. Thanks for the spoiler. Alex calls in to check on her, which Kelly finds oddly sweet. After ending the call, Kelly sends a deceptively cheerful text lying about how she's having fun with Lola to her parents. Kelly talks for a moment about how she usually sleeps in just her underwear, but in this situation where she doesn't feel safe, she's, be she's been layering up in order to sleep. 
which is again going back to my message from the beginning of the video as well as what I said at the end of the last video. If you are ever in a situation where you feel like you can't say yes, then that is not consent. This story literally cannot be redeemed for this point alone. The consent literally does not exist and it doesn't matter how nice Xavier is to her. Callie feels pressure to say yes. That is not consent. Kelly goes to sleep but wakes up to Xavier standing over her. He literally forces her from the bed and what the fork did I just say about consent? He forces her from the room, takes her into his own room, and orders her to strip. Nor present is any actual consent. Kelly refuses at first, but when Xavier comes towards her, he's, she starts to take off her clothes out of fear of what he might do to her. Going to say this one more time, if you are in a situation where you fear for your very life, that is is not consent. Xavier is randomly confused about why it is that Kelly is afraid. He asks that she's the one who sold her blocked cave. Kelly says that it's an agreement, which even a half-baked lawyer would argue that she entered into an agreement with Colton and never agreed to do anything with Xavier. Xavier tells Kelly to go back to her room, but Kelly is just confused over the entire situation since he's the one who dragged her out of bed at 2 a.m. He then randomly takes his shirt off. Kelly gets turned on, and Xavier says that her fear is turning him on. Kelly then grabs her clothes and runs from the room. She later tells Lola about it and calls Xavier sick. Lola says that she saw the brothers coming in last night and thought she saw blood on Colton, but then insists that it must have been a trick of the light. Uh-huh. A trick. Kelly says that she didn't see any blood on Xavier. Alma wants to go looking around the gardens, but Kelly is afraid that they might think that they're running off and press legal charges, which, if you aren't being allowed to leave, then that's another legal term I like to call illegal restraint. As usual, Kelly ends up going along with Lola's dumb plan. However, Kelly draws a line following Lola into the woods, citing an animal attack. However, when Lola goes into the woods and doesn't come out after several minutes, Kelly feels pressured to follow her in. I've said it before, but what a freaking doormat. They walk through the forest, and Lola comments on how pretty that it is. She wants to move there, but Kelly's like, We got trees in Minnesota! Which, yes, yes they do. As they're walking along, Kelly swears that she hears something. Lola is of the opinion that it's probably a rabbit or something, but then something comes racing up from the trees straight at them. The girls panic and take off running, and at one point, Kelly gets separated from Lola. Kelly is running so fast and down a hill that she finds she can't exactly stop, except as Newton's first law states that an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by a force, and the force Kelly runs into is Xavier. And, uh, padding. I hate it, thanks. Chapter 9. This chapter picks up immediately where we left off with Chapter 8. Xavier is angry that Kelly was out in the yard. Colton then has the actual audacity to ask if the girls got permission to leave the house, which is going back to the scene that I keep circling around that the girls are literally prisoners if they can't even step outside. Anyway, Lola tries to soften the blow for Kelly by insisting that she's the one who pressured Kelly into going out into the woods. Colton then says that he'll take her for a drive, which, hmm, no. Never get into a car and never go to a secondary location. This is basic survival 101. Even Kelly thinks that Lola wasn't even given a choice in the matter. Lola had gone off with Colton because he practically forced her. Exactly what kind of super sheltered life does anybody have to lead in order to look at something like this and reason with yourself that not only is this okay, but it's also relationship goals. Xavier comes into the living room where Callie is. He tells her that Colton is confused as to why Xavier hasn't had Callie yet. He goes on to say that he thinks that this is fun to torment Callie when it's obvious that she's terrified of him. He touches her and asks her about the water level in her cave. And okay, so time out right now. I'm not going to yuck on somebody's yum. If you're into fear and stuff like this, then that's your business. My problem is that this isn't obeying the three PDSM rules. Safe, sane, and consensual. As I keep stressing, Kelly feels pressured into saying yes and literally fears for her safety for her very life if she says no and rejects them. That's two of the three rules right there. And now that I'm thinking about it, those rules should probably apply to every aspect of your life and not just fun stuff. Like with Lola pressuring Kelly into the blocked cave auction. Is selling your body to strangers online safe or sane? Nope.
And before anybody asks, I only know about this because of the Fifty Shades series. And if you're like, but that was never in the series, and that's my point, is that I actually did research into all of this despite me not having any interest in it whatsoever, and I somehow came out knowing more about the series than James even attempted to. But unrelated ranting aside, back to the story. Before Xavier can pressure Kelly into going further, Colton and Lola came back. They probably drove to the street and came right back because they probably couldn't have been gone longer than five minutes. Colton calls Xavier away and Lola asks what happened while they were gone. Kelly refuses to talk about it because, yeah, keeping secrets from your singular alley right now seems like a great idea. Alex calls in and gives Kelly an out. They talk for a moment, but much like everything else so far, it's pointless and goes nowhere. L L Lola pesters Kelly until she hangs up on Alex and then continues to pester her friend. Lola asks that Kelly was turned on by Xavier. Kelly insists that she's only just doing this for the money, that her mom is sick, and Xavier means nothing to her. She feel she says that she feels like a caged mouse and that she just wants to get this entire thing over with so that she can leave. However, Lola, absolute best friend of the year, puts words into her mouth and insists that Kelly is into Xavier simply because Kelly is eager to do it with him. Kelly has to bring up one of Lola's terrible ex-boyfriends in order to st get her to stop. Best friend material right there. All the sarcasm. Lola wants to go back to her room, but Kelly's afraid that Xavier would come to her again. However, Lola has to remind Kelly that that's why she's there. And while I am frustrated that Lola is being such an awful friend, I'm also frustrated at Kelly's constant back and forth. She says that she wants to get it over with, but a few paragraphs later, she is so afraid of it actually happening. Pick a lane here. Kelly looks out the window that overlooks the forest. Both girls agree that they hate it now. However, they can't help but note that the boys are going into the forest despite the fact that it's around 11 p.m. now. Lola suggests that they should go fart in the pillows now that they're gone, which is something that every mature person should think. All the sarcasm. Even Kelly thinks that at 22 years old, Lola is still cracking fart jokes isn't funny. But then they go and stand outside of Colton's room. Kelly ran a Kelly randomly mentions the guy Lola has been talking to online. However, Lola seems to be of the opinion that the money gained from this, she could go see him. Which, um, excuse me, that money is Kelly's. And if Kelly actually had a spine, she'd tell Lola to go get some booty call money some other way. Colton comes back just as Lola is talking about that. He's angry with the thought that they were in his room, but Xavier calls them away just then. The girls agree that it would be best to get away while they still can. As Kelly's about to shut the curtains into her room, she looks outside and sees a huge wolf, which pretends to be shocked. Also, could have sworn that Lola mentioned something about werewolves and pack at the beginning of the story. She specifically said something about human man, which is... Just such a really weird thing to say if you're actually a human. I don't know what's going on. At this point, the author has plenty of plot holes big enough to drive a 747 through. So yeah, this story still isn't relationship goals. But if you're still not convinced after these videos, I don't think that literally anything that I could say could possibly change your mind. Just go away because I literally don't even care about whatever poop excuses that you're telling yourself about this. Hopefully I will have more of a break before I post the next video for this. Bye.